Hi, I'm Len. Uh, let me tell you a little story. On August 23, 2012, I was interviewed by Joseph Skybell, who's the director of the Elman Lectures at Emory University, where I work, and Hal Jacobs, who's Emory's videographer extraordinaire. Uh, as part of a series of interviews they were doing with people uh, in the run-up to Paul Simon's visit to Emory University as the 12th Elman Lecturer. Uh, unfortunately, they were unable to use the footage they shot with me. However, they were kind enough to allow me to use that footage myself. The following is that interview in a slightly edited form. I was absolutely overjoyed. Uh, it was a fantastic moment for me because I'm, I'm beyond a fan. As an artist, he's also one of my primary influences, and I just, uh, to, it's very difficult for me to describe the loyalty and love that I feel for his work, and it's just been such a central part of my life since I was about 14. You know, so a friend of mine, uh, his family had the ubiquitous Simon and Garfunkel's Greatest Hits album at their house and started listening to it there and then just took off, you know. Uh, I told my wife and my son the other night, I said, you know, the first album I ever bought was an, an evening with Groucho. The second album I ever bought with my own money was uh, still crazy after all these years. And uh, I wore that out. I've worn all of them out. And his artistry just astounds me. He, he really. It's a lot of things. The words, of course. And how the words have progressed and changed over time, you know, that that when I was 19 and heard the song uh, Leaves That Are Green the first time, well, it's, you know, it starts out with, I was 21 years when I wrote this song. Well, I was about 19, but like the narrator of the song, my heart was filled with the love of a girl. I held her close and she faded in the night, like a poem I meant to write. And that just strikes at the heart of my being. And as I've grown older, his lyrics have changed too, you know, and, and they've gotten more abstract and uh, the subject matter has changed. You know, he's the only uh, pop artist of his generation, I think, who's actually writing about grown-up things that, uh, you know, the <laughs> The Rolling Stones toured a couple of years ago, came out with a new album or something. I heard this song, and they're still writing songs about picking up 17-year-old chicks. And he's writing about family, and he's writing about how you use family as a defense against the, the, the existential loneliness that we all feel. And uh, that progression has always fascinated me. I think he's also, he's very economical. And, uh, and that's influenced me artistically because cutting it to the bone is a really good thing. And he also knows how to approach emotional subjects in unsentimental ways. And, and uh, I'm always fascinated by that. Can you give us an example? There is a song on his album Surprise called Beautiful that's about a couple who adopt children from around the world, these babies. And he goes through each baby that, of the three that they uh, adopt. And there's a, there's a bridge, basically, that, that it's uh, little kids walking in the sand, legs like rubber bands, summertime, summertime, there's a line at the candy stand. You better keep an eye on those children. Eye on those children in the pool. You know, and that's, that's truth. There's also, there's another song on that album where the line is so simple. It's, uh, 
fried chicken and a corn muffin. That sounds more like love. And that, that, that is so true. You know, it, it cuts through all the nonsense and it's not sentimental and it's absolutely friggin' true. Uh, and I think that's what I've always responded to is that he's always, he's an artist who's always trying to get at the truth of the matter. Uh, and, and doing so with an almost surgical um, economy. It's amazing. It's a, the growth is absolutely astounding because he always changes musically and lyrically. And the music has just gotten uh, increasingly complex. And now the songs, you know, the songs used to have nice little hooks and, you know, uh, verse, verse, bridge, verse kind of structure. And now they're subtler. You have to listen to them a few times before you start going, oh yeah, that, that really is, it's still got that same, it has an echo of that structure. But now it's in this much subtler form that you have to listen to. And, and the, the stories he's telling are, are very interesting and, and he's very concerned now, you know, being, sorry Paul, but 70 or in his 70s, actually. Um, with ultimate questions about life, death, God in a way, but the, with more of the God idea than with uh, promoting a particular brand of God. <laughs> and. Uh, it's just, it's, it's very interesting to me. I think there will be at least one lecture that's going to be on craft because at base he is a craftsman of song and of recording too. He's an excellent producer. And after that, I'm not really sure, you know, if he's going to get into thematic concerns, which he might, I mean, certainly some concerns have been consistent throughout from, you know, Sounds of Silence on. Recently, I've been thinking about how he has a very consistent theme that pops up throughout that has to do with how much emphasis we put on being individuals when in reality we're so much alike, you know, and it, it really starts coming right to the surface in songs like The Myth of Fingerprints on Graceland. You know, that's what that song's about. It's the myth of fingerprints that we're all different when we're actually primarily the same. And in recent albums, it's just all over. The okay, let me think of a good example, this might take me a half a tick. <laughs> on, on Surprise, there's a song that begins with the narrator talking about how he went, uh, I registered to vote today, felt like a fool, uh, had to do it anyway down at the high school. Think about second line, you know, felt like a fool. Uh, people say it all the time. And I think that that's kind of about how what we're trying to do is state our own individual portion, uh, our, our own individuality, and yet the truth is we're not. There's also a song on that called how, do, how Can I Live in the Northeast? How Can You Live in the Northeast? You know, and that's the whole question of how can you live in the Northeast? How can you live in the South? How can you live by the banks of a river where the floodwaters pour from the mouth? How can you tattoo your body? How can you cover your head? How can you eat from a rice bowl when the holy man only breaks bread? And it's about how we keep ourselves apart with these artificial uh, constraints, you know, that, uh, that I think that's a very interesting question to him and, and that he sees as being perhaps the final frontier that we need to cross in order to have some kind of uh, true humanity towards one another. Okay. <laughs>
I have been thinking. Even listening deeply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, he, he and Woody Allen are like, you know, my two. Woody Allen? Yeah. And, and Woody Allen is an influence on Paul Simon, so. How do you see that? Uh, from you Paul know? Simon read it and <laughs> said it in an interview. I, in what way? Uh, he, he just thought, when this was probably, boy, this was in the 80s, I guess, but he, he just thought that uh, Woody was a supreme artist. Uh, he's somebody who follows his own vision and uh, doesn't compromise it. I think Paul's like that. You know, he's, he's been very smart on the business end of things so that he keeps absolute control of his work. And I think he admired that in, in Woody as well. So, but yeah, this came out of an interview. In in terms of music, I, you know, his his musical background, as I understand it, came from certainly early rock and roll and Elvis and you know uh, Chuck Berry. You know, John Lennon said something about. Uh, all rock and roll goes back to Chuck Berry and uh, the Everly Brothers for, for Simon and Garfunkel, of course. But he also, he was listening to a lot of gospel music because growing up in Queens, they late at night you could pick up gospel stations on the radio and he would listen to that. So he's always been interested in gospel music. Uh, you know, and I think then Dylan, you know, of course, the, just who Dylan was in the early 60s, that obviously had an influence on him. Um, I don't know as much about um, who his literary heroes might be. I do remember that the first time I ever encountered Ted Hughes was on the back of the, uh, the Still Crazy album, looking at the lyrics and uh, as a monograph to uh, My Little Town, it's a quotation from uh, Crow by Ted Hughes. And uh, oh, well, that's pretty neat. You know, so that was kind of brought me towards to, to check out Ted Hughes a little bit. But I think a lot of poets, a lot of, lot of poets. How people, people look at him his work in certain periods rather than the totality of his work and it's because it's always changing that he's he has had a couple of times where uh, the audience didn't go with him um, when he made one trick pony people didn't seem to like that even though I love that album well I love all his albums I'm, I'm not a good witness to that uh, but then after, I do know some people who, when they heard Graceland, felt it was a betrayal of the whole folk kind of thing. And then after, after he'd done Graceland and Rhythm of the Saints, and then he's working on Cape Man, and he's not doing world music anymore, well then there were all these world music people who just got ticked off with him for not being faithful to that particular dogma and instead you know he's he's just going down the road trying to find interesting rhythms apparently he starts with rhythm a lot and uh, developing a different way of approaching his songwriting that comes more organically through the recording process rather than uh, being here I wrote Mrs. Robinson now let's do it so I think he's he's had these ups and downs uh, and I think a lot of people don't know what to do with him because at, at the same time that he's getting mediocre reviews for You're the One, he gets nominated for a Grammy, possibly because he hadn't been around for a while. I do. Uh, there's th one other lyric I, I've been obsessing on recently because it's, I don't usually cry at songs. You know, I can listen to, uh, you know, the anniversary waltz or something and keep, keep completely dry. But there's a, a sequence from the song, The Cool, Cool River, on, on Rhythm of the Saints that's, uh, hard times I'm used to them, 
The speeding planet burns. I'm used to that. My life's so calm and it disappears. And when every time I hear that, it just, there is something deep inside me that just kind of goes pop. And, and now, with his later songs, that's happening more and more for me. That, like that song, Beautiful. I get teary-eyed every time I listen to it, and I don't know why, except it's about little kids with rubber band legs. <laughs> and I know what that is. So, so yeah, he's my great hero. He is really my great hero, and if I get the chance to meet him, I'm probably going to have some kind of connection. But we'll we'll try our best. Keep you away from me. <laughs> be a <laughs> polite connection. Because I'll be like, oh, there's Lynn. Let's go over here, Paul. No, I'll probably just say, I had to have you. I had to have you. Yeah, you, you're very good. I like you. <laughs> I actually get that all the time. Yeah. In preparing for this, she actually wrote a blog post so she could get her thoughts out. Her situation was uh, that Paul Simon is one of the earliest artists she was ever exposed to. That She was born in 1972 and her mother had the uh, Paul Simon album which came out in 1972 and she kind of grew up with that and uh, the image of him in the parka on the on the front of it that you know apparently it took her some years to figure out that oh that's a jacket that he's in and <laughs> he's not like a fur bearing quadruped or something but the, her interest in him goes back that far and one of the interesting things is uh, on the evening of our first date she came to pick me up at work and uh, I got in the car and she was listening to the collection negotiations and love songs and I said Paul Simon she said oh he's my favorite and I said well that's it we're we're destined you know we had that in the Simpsons together and we we're just you know I, I knew that I'd pick the right one yeah. my my son's 13. 13 yeah and he's he has been raised on a steady 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 diet of Paul Simon yeah <laughs> and, he, and he still likes them, so we haven't overdone it. So, yeah. yeah, I've got him hooked on the Beatles and Paul Simon, so my work's done. <laughs> <laughs> He's on The Muppet Show. It's actually a good episode. Uh, and he, he, he does a, a song on there from uh, One Trick Pony that uh, I can't think the name of right now, but it's not one that you hear all the time. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not late in the evening. Or. I certainly watch them. Uh, yes, I remember watching them, enjoying them, uh, particularly uh, <laughs> him being in the turkey suit. <laughs> that that's uh, that may be my favorite SNL moment of all time. Him trying to get through the door, saying, "I can't get through the doorway," <laughs> and. Uh, and him with uh, with George Harrison, where they trade off singing, you know, the songs, doing songs together. That was that was pretty neat because they're, for one thing, their their guitar styles are completely different, and yet it went along. Uh, they went together so well, so it was it was interesting. Yeah, and I did watch his. He had a special in the '70s too that I I forced my family to watch. Yeah, yeah. I think that might have been. I forget if it was on that or if it was on an SNL where they did a thing about him playing basketball with Connie Hawkins. Uh, oh, I, that must have been uh, SNL stuff. Yeah. yeah, but the special was good. It was the same kind of thing. I think the you know some of the SNL writers were in. I think yeah. Alan Zweibel and some other people. That's the end of the interview. Um, that was just the first in a string of very interesting experiences that I had uh, in connection with Paul Simon's visit to Emory. But more about that in a future film. Well, I think he I think he knows he's short by now.